Just like Michelangelo into the blue on heavenly wings. Cargo hand bones don't take off no smoke, no mirror, no strings. I can't take off these dark shades. I can only say how it's too beautiful. Our town, our town on TV, our town. You and me Upside down Hanging out of an airplane Welcome to Our Town. I'm your host, Larry Frost, and today with the Ainsby Cultural Center, we'll be reviewing a summer safety lecture and pandemic flu planning. So, Let's go ahead and check it out. So if you open your presentation, let's yeah. make sure that most of the words are yeah. legible. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Carol Chamberlain, Assistant Director at the Ainsbury Public Library, and I want to welcome you to the Ainsbury Cultural Center tonight and to our lectures on pandemic flu planning and summer safety. Uh, we have two speakers this evening, and I'd like to introduce them um, in one moment, just a couple logistics um, for this evening. Um, if you uh, would all mind um, signing in, uh, there is a... Um, uh, no, uh, spot right on the uh, side table here by the beautiful plants and flowers. We would appreciate it. I uh, also wanted to point out the restrooms are on your left. Um, if you go straight through all the way down the corridor. Um, another thing I'd like to point out about this building is that um, we do ask you to use uh, this front exit, uh, entrance exit only. Uh, because these other exits, all the other exits that you see uh, in this building um, are alarmed at the moment. Okay, um, so. Uh, yes, and thank you, <laughs> thank you, Terry. And I'm pleased to uh, ask you all to turn off your cell phones. Um, a couple, couple other things. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Before we get going, um, please feel free uh, to step up at any time, and uh, we have some refreshments in the back, um, drinks and um, sweets. And also wanted to point out, um, I wanted to thank the friends of the Amesbury Public Library for their support of this program tonight. Uh, and I also wanted to point out at the back rear table, we have um, a few... Uh, of the new books we have um, recently purchased in the library um, about pandemic planning and bird flu and other topics. Okay, and now um, I would like to introduce to you, we have two speakers this evening. The first, um, Terry Arsenault, who is the Amesbury Public Health Nurse, and um, Esteban Cuevas Enclay, who is here from the Northeast Massachusetts Mosquito Control and Wetlands Management District. Uh, and I will turn it over to Esteban. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Do I have to speak to the mic to be heard? Okay. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm from the Northeast Massachusetts Mosquito Control District, and uh, my job, as you see on the screen, is the entomologist. In other words, I deal specifically with the mosquitoes. Um, I run the surveillance program, so we keep track of their numbers. We keep track of the species. We try to get an idea of what's the mosquito 
activity and how that relates to the transmission of disease agents like viruses. So that's my job. I don't get involved with the, with the spraying or, or the digging of ditches. I just deal with the mosquitoes directly. So, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit this evening about mosquitoes and the agents that they transmit, which we call arboviruses. Like I said, I run the surveillance program, and I have a very able associate working with me, and him and I do all the identifications of the mosquitoes that we collect. Um, we have a surveillance season, the time when the mosquitoes are active, and we are collecting them, and it runs from the first week of May until the last week of September. So for the past uh, two and a half weeks, we've been collecting mosquitoes. Not very many, but we've been collecting mosquitoes. And we start off in May because we want to give a chance to test our equipment, make sure everything is working, so that when the summer really hits and mosquito populations are booming, we've, can, we can collect them, we can identify them, and then make decisions. So the season runs from May till September. We collect from our traps two times a week. The traps operate on two 24-hour cycles. So um, for example, the traps go on at 6 o'clock Sunday morning, and they run till about 6 or 7 the following uh, they run from Sunday morning to Monday morning, and then they go on again Tuesday morning at 6 o'clock, and then they go off at Wednesday between 6, 7, or 8, depending on when our collectors pick them up. So we have uh, surveillance traps. We also have something called resting boxes, which are designed to pick up the mosquitoes that transmit eastern equine encephalitis virus. So we have two sets of, of uh, trapping instruments out in the field. All the identifications, and we do identify every mosquito that we collect. Uh, I like to do it because um, it's good to, to get a good feel of what's going on outside. And uh, I find it challenging. I, I, I like working on mosquitoes. I used to be a college professor, and let me tell you something. Um, identifying mosquitoes is far, far easier than reading uh, freshman biology lab reports. Let me tell you. That was hard. Um, now, with some of the mosquitoes, certain species, we select, we separate, and then we send to Boston for testing. These are the species of mosquitoes that normally transmit Eastern Equine Encephalitis Virus or West Nile Virus. So we want to see if these mosquitoes are carrying those viruses. So we separate those mosquitoes and send them to Boston for virus testing. Now, we've had West Nile Virus in this part of Massachusetts pretty much since 2001. West Nile first appeared in Massachusetts in 2000. 2001, it came up to this area along the Merrimack Valley. And that was our big problem until 2004 when Eastern Equine Encephalitis Virus came on the scene. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on Eastern because it's the, the, uh, the, the arbovirus du jour. It's the one that people are really worried about, and they have good reasons to worry about. In 2006, last year, we had isolations of Tripoli and mosquitoes in Amesbury, Merrimack, uh, Haverhill, and Methuen, so all on the border with New Hampshire. We also had isolations in Boxford and Hamilton. What I'm not going to show you is on the other side, all this area here is in red. And it, it turns out that this area here of, of uh, Plastow, um, Exeter, Newton, this area seems to be this center or, 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 or ground zero of eastern equine encephalitis virus. And the problem is that this has never appeared until uh, three years ago, and the question is why? What's going on? What's going on here that's causing this virus to appear and spread down to Massachusetts? Now, I mentioned the word arbovirus. What does that mean? Well, arbovirus comes from the, the designation of arthropod-borne viruses. In other words, these are viruses that have to get from vertebrate to vertebrate by the, the bite of an arthropod either a mosquito or a tick. The mosquitoes and the ticks are the two greatest vectors of arboviruses. And in the case of Eastern Equine Encephalitis and West Nile Virus, the arthropod responsible for transmission is the mosquito. Talk a little bit about the transmission cycle. We use West Nile Virus as, as an example, but the cycle is the same for Eastern. These are viruses of birds, okay? Birds are the normal vertebrate host of these viruses. What's going on in most birds, we don't really know. But apparently, uh, either weakened birds or exotic birds, or birds that, that just arrived, are very susceptible to the effects of the virus, and they die. Unfortunately, most of them die in areas where we don't see them, unless they die in your backyard. And then suddenly, we, we, we notice it, we report that. But these are, are viruses of birds, and the birds get it by the vitamin mosquito. And, and the mosquito's not born with the virus, as far as we know. The mosquito has to get it from an infected bird. The, the mosquito bites the bird. And then 
in, uh, within a couple of days, she's ready to transmit the virus to another bird. So these are, are mosquito-borne viruses. They need a mosquito to get from host to host. They can't travel on their own. You can't, uh, um, you, the virus is not transmitted by sneezing. It's not transmitted by, 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 uh, by sexual activity. It's transmitted by the bite of a mosquito. Now this is a cycle, bird, mosquito bird, that goes on pretty much April, May, June, July, maybe early August. Then what happens in mid-August, things start changing. Many of the birds start disappearing, they start flying south. The mosquito still needs to get a blood meal. Why? I'll explain in a couple of minutes. So then the mosquito then will go after the next big convenient target to get a blood, feel, blood meal from. In this case, it's going to be horse. And if there are no horses around, it's going to be people. So we are considered uh, accidental hosts. We're not the, the best host of the virus. And because we're not the best host of the virus, the virus goes haywire inside us, and that's why we have these strange manifestations that we call encephalitis. It's because we're the wrong host for the virus. Unfortunately, it, it, it may kill us as well as destroy the virus. So Eastern Equine Encephalitis Virus, I'll refer to this as Triple E uh, from here on because that's a long, long name, it's a tongue twister, and it's been a long day. Now, symptomatic hosts, people that exhibit symptoms, usually begin with fevers, but in more severe cases, it can spread to the central nervous system. And when it spreads to the central nervous system, especially in the brain, it causes a series of symptoms that we call encephalitides. And therefore, we get the term encephalitis. Now, encephalitis is defined as an inflammation of the brain. Encephalitis is caused by a number of agents, including other viruses, bacteria, and other agents. So when you hear encephalitis, don't automatically assume, oh, it's caused by a mosquito. There are other sources of, of agents that cause encephalitis in people. Now, the symptoms of triple E infections in humans. First question is, how many people get bitten and infected? The answer is we don't know. The percentage of infected asymptomatic persons is not known. What I mean by that is that if you look at West Nile virus, West Nile virus is said to uh, infect people, but something where about 80% of the people who get infected with West Nile virus never know that they're infected. Either they don't show symptoms or they show very mild symptoms, like maybe a sneeze or a, or a cough or maybe a, a, a cold, a, a, a mild cold. So for 80% of the people infected with West Nile, they never show any symptoms. Other 20% show some symptoms and then maybe 1% actually exhibit disease. With Eastern, we don't know if people who get infected um, never show any signs and symptoms. So far, all we know is that if you get infected with Eastern equine encephalitis virus, you're going to get sick. What are the symptoms? Well, first of all, it takes about three to 10 days after you're bitten to start displaying the symptoms. And what are they? Well, like, like a lot of these uh, infections, a high fever, a stiff neck, you'll get a headache of increasing severity, you begin to exhibit lack of energy. In more severe cases, you'll go into a coma and then you'll die within a week. So the encephalitis is the most dangerous symptom. Once you get into the encephalitis stage, um, either, either, either you're gonna die or you're gonna be very sick for the rest of your life. 35% of the survivors exhibit mild to severe neurological disease. What I'm trying to say with that is that if you don't die from Eastern, you never really fully recover. And if you're a relatively young person and you get infected with Eastern and you don't die, you're looking at maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 years of various forms of paralysis, various forms of, of nerve damage, uh, ner nervous system damage, which, again, it's going to severely affect your quality of life, and also it's going to be expensive. That's something that we don't want to talk about, but this kind of medical care is extremely expensive and that we're all paying for. The case fatality rate overall is about 35%. In other words, about 35% of all people who come down with Eastern die which is a much higher percentage than West Nile virus. Remember, West Nile virus, I said, about maybe 1% of the infected cases ends up dying. So Eastern is a much more dangerous, or as we like to say, a more virulent virus. As I said, Eastern is more virulent than West Nile virus. It has a greater morbidity and, more, and fatality rates. In other words, more, uh, if you exhibit the signs and symptoms, there are higher chances that you're going to die even though the infection rate is much lower. Very few people get infected with Eastern compared to West Nile virus, but the few that get infected, more of them exhibit serious disease and more of them die. If you recover, the convalescence period is far longer than it is with West Nile virus. 
And as I said before, total recovery may never be achieved. You may never fully recover. So you have permanent brain or nervous system damage, and this is going to require extensive, expensive, and permanent medical institutional care. Now, some of the, I get a lot of questions about Eastern, and I thought I'd share some of these with you and the answer. For example, why is it called equine? Well, it's called equine because when the virus expands from its bird-to-bird -bird cycle, horses are the first to be infected and the first to be diseased. At one time, we thought that the horses got a different disease than what the humans, but it turns out it's the same disease as the same virus. It's just that horses get it first. In fact, we use horses as sort of like an early warning sign that, uh, that, that Eastern is in the area and that people have to protect themselves. Why horses and humans are infected? As I said before, these are accidental hosts. The mosquito is looking for a source of blood. If she doesn't get it from birds, she'll find it from the first big convenient animal that's nearby. That's standing around, that's out in the open, not protecting itself. In this case, it's going to be the horses and humans. A question I get a lot is this one. Can you get triple E virus from an infected horse? No. In other words, if, you, if your horse was sick and you're going and you're petting your horse, can you get the virus that way? No. You need, to get, uh, you need to be infected with the bite of a mosquito. You can't get the infection directly from a horse. It's impossible. Can Eastern be cured with drugs? Because it's a viral infection, the answer is no. Viruses, according to most biologists, and I tend to believe this, viruses, because they don't fulfill all the characteristics of living things, are not considered to be alive. And because they don't exhibit these characteristics, because they don't have any metabolism, because they don't have a nucleus, because all those things you learn in biology about a cell, viruses don't have. Therefore, they're not considered to be alive. So all the drugs that have been developed to, to treat bacteria are, 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 are waste against viruses. So these, these diseases caused by viruses cannot be cured by drugs. Is there a vaccine available for Eastern? For horses, yes, but not for humans. And if you ask the question, well, why? The answer is pretty much economics. It's very, very extremely expensive to develop a vaccine to put it on the market. And because Eastern affects so few people in the overall scheme of things, it's not worth it for a drug company to, to invest the time and money. It could be anywhere from 5, 10, 15 years to, to develop a, a vaccine to be, to, to be put in the market. It's not worth the money, according to these companies. Now, horses, because there's a big economic interest in horses, it's a different story. Now, the mosquito. The mosquito is called a vector because a vector is any agent, any vehicle, that transmits an agent of disease. So mosquitoes are really vehicles of, of, of viruses. And very quickly, the life cycle of a mosquito is as follows. Now, this is not true for all mosquitoes. For example, we have the, the female here, and the female lays eggs. Now, these eggs are resting together in a clump on, on top of a uh, body of water. We call this an egg raft. Not all species of mosquitoes do this. Some mosquitoes will lay their eggs on wet vegetation. Other mosquitoes will lay their eggs in mud, in wet mud. So this part varies, but all mosquitoes have to lay eggs. These eggs have to come into contact with water, and then the eggs hatch. And out comes this immature form that's called the larva. Sometimes we call it the wiggler. And the wiggler has only one purpose in life, to eat feed, because that's how the mosquito builds up its body mass, okay? It does it as a larva. So all it does is eat. It will grow, molt, and grow, and after it molts three times, it becomes a cocoon, which we call a pupa. And like a cocoon with the butterfly, inside here, metamorphosis has taken place. All the larval tissues are breaking down, and all the adult tissues are developing. And from this pupa, then, emerges the adult, and the males and females mate, and the cycle begins again. Now, this here is a female mosquito, and it's the female mosquitoes that take blood, not males. Females take blood only because they need the blood uh, to extract proteins to then put into their eggs to, then, uh, to, to complete egg development. So it's only females that take a blood meal. And because they're taking blood for egg development, not for nutrition, they don't feed every damn blood. Now, I get one question. Are all mosquitoes the same? The answer is no. Worldwide, there are about 3,000 species or different kinds of mosquitoes in the world. In Massachusetts, we have about 50 species of mosquitoes. However, if you ask how many of them are dangerous to people, only about a dozen. And these are the ones that we focus in our surveillance. Now, do all mosquitoes develop in water? The answer, of course, is yes. But different species require different kinds of water. 
For example, if you got putrid water in a rain barrel or in a bird bath in your backyard, that's going to attract one type of mosquito, Culex pipiens. That's the only kind of, of, of environment that can lay their eggs. Other mosquitoes lay their eggs in putrid organic water in tree holes or in the discarded tires because the discarded tires are very much like tree holes. So the mosquitoes, these same species will breed in that. Other species require brackish or slightly salt water in the salt marshes and roadside ditches. They can't breed anywhere else. So the mosquitoes that come off the salt marsh, they can only develop in brackish water. You put them in fresh water, they die. And then you have mosquitoes that are developing from the cold, cold water that comes from melting snow pools. You got snow, uh, packs of snow and ice that begins to melt. You got one or two degrees above freezing, and you'll see mosquito larvae developing. Of course, because that water is cold, it's going to take them a long time to develop, but they're developing. So different species require different kinds of water to develop. This first one here is the one that we're most interested in because these mosquitoes that, that breed in, in artificial containers, like the stuff we find in our backyards, are the ones that are transmitting West Nile and possibly Eastern. Now, a question that I've been getting a lot the last couple of weeks is this one. Does plenty of water result in plenty of mosquitoes? Oh, with all the rain we're going to have, we're going to have a lot of mosquitoes, right? Not necessarily. And here's why. Because what's important in mosquito populations is the abundance and the timing of the water. Not so much a lot of water, but when the water is falling. For example, Culex pipiens, this is the one that breeds in your backyards, these populations explode during droughts. In times of heavy water uh, abundance, you don't see that many. But in droughts, they develop like crazy. That's why in times of hot, dry summers, you see West Nile virus cases increasing because the mosquito that transmits the virus, Culex pipiens, does very well in droughts. Other mosquitoes, like the salt marsh mosquitoes and floodwater mosquitoes, their populations will stay very low if the breeding sites are constantly flooded or constantly dry. So if they're constantly full of water, those eggs will never hatch. If they're dry, of course they're not going to hatch. It's the timing of the water. If the, if, the, if the mud dries and they gets flooded, then the eggs hatch. But if it stays flooded all the time, you're not going to see any hatching. Who does the binding? Binding is only done by the female, since blood is required only to complete egg development. How do they stay alive? They like to feed on nectar and sugar water, and that's where the males also feed on. Males don't take blood. They, they, they need to stay alive and eat a source of energy to, 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 to do their activities, so they'll feed on nectar or any source of sugar water, but they don't take blood, only females. How often do mosquitoes blood feed? Again, depending on the species and the temperature, every five to seven days. So in other words, if a day like today, a mosquito takes a bite off you, it'll take her about seven days to complete the egg development, lay her eggs, and then she'll be ready for a blood meal. If it's 90 degrees for, for, for several days, it may take as little as three days. So temperature and species will affect how quickly they, they will take blood. How long do adults live? Well, again, depending on species, temperature, and the time of the year. It could be anywhere from three to four weeks or eight to nine months. Let me explain. Culex pipiens. That's mosquito. It appears in the summertime. In uh, July and August, it may live maybe three or four weeks. However, one more generation of that species uh, emerges in September. And instead of looking for blood to bite, they will go down into catch basins, they'll go down into your cellars, they'll go down uh, into the sewers, and they'll go into, into these areas, they'll stand on the walls, they'll sit on the walls, and they'll stay that way for the whole winter. They hibernate as adults. And then come springtime, they'll emerge, and then they'll take a blood meal. So those, those, those populations can live anywhere from eight to nine months. Of course, most of the time, they're not doing anything. They're just basically hibernating. But if you ask the question, in the summertime, it's probably three to four weeks, maybe five weeks. Now, does every mosquito species bite every vertebrate? No. Some species will bite one class of host, whereas some will bite a variety of host. Culex pipiens, the one I've been talking about, bites birds most of the year. And then something happens in the middle of the summer when she starts shifting to biting humans and we think it's because the birds have left. So this thing that some species may switch hosts when necessary, that seems to be a, a phenomenon in many mosquito species. 
So the, the textbooks will say, so-and-so species feeds only on birds, so-and-so species feeds only on amphibians. That's true most of the time, but mosquitoes, when necessary, can switch, and that's where the problems come in. When are mosquitoes most dangerous? Well, usually the mosquitoes that are old, anywhere that's more than three weeks old, these are considered dangerous because since they've been old, they must have bitten at least two, three, maybe four times. And the more times the mosquito bites a vertebrate, the greater the chances that she'll pick up a virus from one of those uh, hosts. So older mosquitoes are considered to be the most dangerous because they've bitten more and there's a higher chance of them being infected with a virus. So when are we most at risk to infection by an, arbor, uh, by an arbovirus? Well, from midsummer to midfall is the time when we have to be most uh, concerned. This is when the vector mosquitoes are switching the host. Culex pipiens are switching from birds and biting humans. The vector of eastern equine encephalitis virus, a mosquito called Culicida melanora. That one, we believe, may be switching hosts as well and biting humans. How about during the day? When's the most dangerous in the day? Well, from the late afternoon to mid-evening, that seems to be the most dangerous, or that's when you're most are likely to be bitten because that's when the vector species are most active. Now, different species are active at different times of the day, but the ones that we're worried about, these vectors of Tripoli e and West Nile, they seem to be active mostly in the late afternoon and the early evenings. What particular special time do we have to be concerned? Well, when it's very, very hot and when we were going through a drought because that's when the vector species, especially Culex pipiens, these are most abundant. So if it's a hot summer and a drought, you have to be really concerned. And finally, when older infected vectors are most prevalent, and that's gonna be probably from late August into September. That's when these old mosquitoes are still alive and still biting, that's when we're most at risk. And that's when you start seeing humans come down with these diseases. People ask me, what's gonna happen this year? My first response is, I don't know. It depends on the weather. But we're going to make some assumptions. We'll assume that, that Eastern is still in the area. It's still circulating, and there's a chance it's going to spill over to mammals. So what are the unknowns here? What, what, what are the factors that are going to affect the spillover? Well, the weather is going to be the biggest factor. The weather is going to affect the birds, and it's going to affect vector activity. And then what's the population of all these vectors? Is it going to be high or is it going to be low? Then which mammals are going to be infected first? Usually it's horses, but if all the horses are vaccinated, then it could be humans. When and where will the infections appear? That's the greatest unknown of all. So what we do in mosquito control is that we keep track of the mosquitoes, we have them tested for virus, and when and where and what species that do become infected, we then talk with the Board of Health of Ainsbury and decide on, on strategies. Ainsbury has had eastern equine encephalitis isolations. They also had West Nile virus isolations. So when we get the reports, we talk to the Board of Health, and we decide, well, if, if it's in early September, it's still warm, people are active outside, maybe we might, we might do a limited spray, uh, uh, a truck spray. If it's late September, most likely we're not going to do any spraying because it's getting cooler, there's less people active at night, there's less mosquitoes. So again, the timing of these events will determine what kind of actions we're going to take. What about West Nile virus? The key here is a summer-long drought. If we have a long drought this summer, don't be surprised if we're going to see West Nile virus appear again. As I said before, when you have a drought, you have a greater abundance of standing water. Why? Because Rivers, streams, ponds, during the drought, they start drying up. But along the edges of these bodies of water, you have these little isolated pools. They all have a lot of crap and crud in them. And that's the kind of water that these mosquitoes like to breed in. So greater abundance of, of standing water is going to result in greater abundance of these container breeding mosquitoes, Culex pipiens, Culex restaurants. Also, with droughts, birds and mosquitoes are going to cluster together in these watering holes. So you're going to have a lot of biting going on, a lot of transmission of virus. And then when you get a major rain event that disperses everything, going to disperse the mosquitoes away from the birds, they're going to find something else to bite on, you or me. Again, the when and where of the bird isolations, mosquito, horse, and human infections, these uh, aspects, these data points will determine the action that we will take in conjunction with the Board of Health. We never do anything 
uh, unilaterally. Every action that we take is based on consult cons uh, consultation with the Board of Health of each of our towns. We have 31 towns, and each town has a slightly different plan, and they have different needs, and some towns want spring, some towns don't want spring. So we, we, uh, we bow to the, to the will and the whims of each of our towns. Um, how do you protect yourself? And again, you've heard all this before, it never hurts to repeat. First of all, you try to reduce the vector abundance around you. These are the, the mosquitoes that are, that are most dangerous are what we call container breeding mosquitoes. These are mosquitoes that are going to be breeding in your bird baths, in your uh, water, uh, water barrels, in your discarded tires that, that you love to dump in your backyard. They also breed in rain gutters. So you have to make sure you keep those rain gutters clean. Get all the leaves out of that because if the leaves are blocking the rain gutter, the water's going to stay accumulated. That's perfect developing area for these mosquitoes. So you can eliminate as much as possible the source breeding around your property. Does that solve the problem? No, because maybe your neighbors don't care. Maybe your neighbors got a pool that they haven't used in years and that water's all green and cruddy. You got mosquitoes breeding like crazy there. So how do you protect yourself from the mosquitoes breeding around you? Well, you make sure that your screens, that, that your windows are, are, are screened, that your porches are screened. Even a tiny little tear in the screen is big enough for a mosquito to get in. So make sure that the, the screens are in good shape. You're going to have to suck it up and reduce the time that you're outside when vectors are active. If, you know, find other things to do inside the house, clean the house or something like that. You know, but reduce the amount of time that you're outside. Also, if you're going to be outside, then reduce your exposure to vectors by keeping your skin covered. In other words, you wear a clothing that covers most of your skin as much as possible. And you use insect repellent. Anything that contains uh, the, the chemical DEET is found to be very effective in, in, in repelling mosquitoes from biting. So if you follow these guidelines, you'll reduce the amount of risk. It doesn't eliminate. There's no guarantee. But at least you're reducing the risk. You're, 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 you're helping to protect yourself better. And I want to thank you for your time and attention. And uh, I, you know, if there's any time for questions, I'll hang around for questions. If not, thank you again for your for coming, and thank you for your time and attention. Um, maybe one thing the local Board of Health can, can do is to pass out the free samples of uh, bug spray that we uh, did receive from Stop and Shop. We're grateful for their donation. I'm willing to bet that you already know a lot about um, Lyme disease. So does anyone in the crowd know why, it's why it was named Lyme disease? <laughs> You're kidding, <laughs> Mrs. McBrien. Why, why? Do you know? It, it's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah why, why is it called Lyme disease? It first came out in Lyme, Connecticut. In Lyme, Connecticut. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, let's see. Um, what, uh, how is this disease transmitted to us? <laughs> By? Uh, deer By deer ticks. And uh, what other ticks do you commonly find on your pets? What would we call the common ticks that you see. Pardon me? Dog ticks. Dog ticks. Very good. <laughs> Mrs. You gotta love this, Mrs. McBride. But you know, all kidding aside, every year in the Board of Health, I have residents come in with ticks that they're struggling to identify. People are so worried. Pardon me? They can? <laughs> I, I wish you were going to school in Amesbury. <laughs> I, I make my, uh, these students are from where, Mrs. McBride? All over. But your school is in Dover. In Dover. <laughs> in Dover. We have Dover here, but not too many Amesbury residents, so that's interesting. Um, the ticks that uh, residents bring in to identify, I'm not a professional, what would that be, an entomologist, Esteban? Who identifies a tick? An entomologist, right? I'm trying to think of the big word. Yeah, yeah, a bug identifier. I'm not a professional bug identifier, but I do my best to help residents sort this out because it is unsettling for those who have Lyme disease. Um, I, does anybody in the room have a friend or relative or a neighbor who has Lyme disease? Really? Okay, just for the record, that's the majority of the, the room here. I can tell you as a public health nurse who is responsible for doing surveillance of communicable diseases. Now, Lyme disease is not communicable like other diseases that are transmitted from person to person. But because it was such an important disease to track, 
the Department of Public Health has worked hard to follow Lyme disease because of its devastating effects on people. So this crowd has, uh, knows many people who have the disease, and you know, perhaps from talking to them, that this is not something that you, we want to see increase. Uh, the disease is not pleasant. Tell me anything you know about how the disease, how do you know you have Lyme disease? What happens? Anything, any piece of it? Uh, bullseye rash, oh, Mrs. McBrien, they should, next year, next time we do this, you guys present the lecture. I'm going to pass around, um, I, li I like these pictures. So for you to look at the difference between a dog tick and um, a deer tick, they are quite distinct. The dog ticks that are no problem really have a nice horseshoe around the neck if you can see it on the ticks. It will reassure you that perhaps that's a dog tick that has bitten you. The deer ticks look quite different. They have a red fanny and a black body. And uh, so look at this and pass it around. F uh, fanny being a very technical <laughs> nursing word. <laughs> have to speak to the people. These are pictures of, um, of the bullseye rashes. You'll see some of them that look obviously like a bullseye rash and others that look to me like shingles and everything else. I can't say, I wish that everyone who contracted Lyme disease got this bullseye rash because it's so distinct when it happens that it's pretty much diagnostic for the uh, disease. And doctors will treat based on that uh, before, doing Lyme t before doing titers of blood sometimes. But you'll see the variance in the rash. And I can tell you from the reports that I receive, 10 to 20 percent of the reports that I get a patient will report having had the bullseye rash. That leaves the great majority who don't. Typically people will say, I felt like I had the flu in the summertime, fever, achy joints, um, malaise, tired, um, neurological symptoms, young athletes who will say, to, mom, my knee is sore, my knee is swollen, my knee is sore. And your mom will say, yeah, because you've been running too much and I told you not to overdo it, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not. It's the inception of Lyme disease for young people many times. Otherwise, young, healthy people will complain about a joint that's sore. So if you'll take a look at the rash, um, I mean, there's much more to it. There are information sheets. We want to move the evening along. If you have any particular question, please ask. But take a look at the, at the different uh, bullseye rashes and see how difficult it is for everyone to determine this. Um, and, let's see, one of the little handouts. Here, the questions are going to get tougher. You know, Lyme, Connecticut, that's easy. You, you guys are getting off easy. What stage of uh, deer ticks usually transmit disease? Stages of deer ticks. So just even name the stages. What stages? Um, Esteban mentioned some stages of mosquitoes. Yeah, you know, you can cheat if you look on the, <laughs> actually, if you look on here. Very good, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie's a nurse, too. <laughs> actually, I want, I want all of you to take one or two of these. Since you came, you get to take the tick ID cards from the Department of Public Health this year. They're helpful. You'll see the, um, ba Barbara, are the dog ticks on there, too? Are the dog ticks on there, too, with the deer ticks? The dog ticks on the right? Okay. The dog ticks, you know, some information about dog ticks is on there, and then the deer ticks are on there also. So now you can see the stages of the deer ticks on the card, and so you can cheat and grab an answer. <laughs> what stage of deer ticks usually transmit Lyme disease? Stage. <laughs> Begins with N. <laughs> very good, very good. And... To show you how small most nymph ticks are, <laughs> here, are <laughs> here are some socks from home. <laughs> and I was embarrassed to say, someone said, oh, that, that's a good idea to do with your old, with your old socks. And I have to say, this is, was one of my good, good socks. <laughs> so, but I'm giving it up for the cause here. I'm, and I'm embarrassed. I, I promise to improve these next year. But you'll see the difference of um, deer ticks on a white sock. And, a doc and these are poppy seeds. I'm, I'm sorry, did I make you think that I had like actual ticks on here? I'm sorry. These are poppy seeds, which mimic the size of um, 
the stage that you're dealing with when you're trying to identify this. This is pretty difficult to see when you come in from a nice hike or a baseball game or whatever we all enjoy outdoors. And the, the socks have many on there. Most people come in with one or two on their bodies or their clothing. So this will give you an idea of the size you should be looking for and you should just get in the habit of coming home and checking one another or something. Make some conscious effort to talk about this all the time. That's what I think the battle is here. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pass around my old but clean <laughs> socks and you can just get a visual of what you're dealing with when you talk about Lyme disease, okay? Um, what else about Lyme disease? You have the nice little cards, and actually I think that's going to be it for Lyme disease, unless you have um, questions. Any questions at all about Lyme disease? We promised to talk about the difference between dog and deer ticks. Carol? Yeah, treatment. Treatment. Okay. Um, uh, local uh, primary care providers are becoming more and more aware of uh, di diagnosing Lyme disease and the criteria for it. And so obviously you have to have a diagnosis first and treatment is antibiotics, uh, particularly usually an antibiotic called doxycycline. And um, some practices uh, um, give one dose of doxycycline when they're not exactly sure of a full exposure, but usually a full course of antibiotics is required for treatment and the sooner the better. As Lyme disease um, evolves, the spirochetes, uh, a tick usually embeds itself for 24 hours before it um, injects, uh, transmits the spirochetes into our bodies. So if you go for a walk at two o'clock in the afternoon and you pick a tick off of you at four o'clock, you're not likely to have any problem even if you got bit. They have to be attached for usually 24 hours before they deposit the spirochetes into our bodies. And um, so the earlier it's diagnosed, the earlier the treatment, the better. Because once the spirochetes are deposited, people have Lyme disease as a chronic disease all their lives and have neurological problems, cardiac problems, you know, it's just something we would love to get a grip on. I wish that there was a way to um, spray for them too, Esteban. So, you know, it's not something that's covered by the mosquito spraying project. They are here to stay. The disease is therefore endemic in our area. Essex County, where former Essex County, where we live, is actually not the highest county for this in Massachusetts. Once again, the the, the capes, uh, the Cape counties have higher, Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard have higher incidence of the disease than we do, but you know that there's plenty of it here, so I ask that you be diligent and get in the habit of tick checks and maybe wearing your socks over your pants, as geeky as that is to do. It's, um, it prevents the ticks from cre creeping up inside your clothing. So if you're in a, on a fall hike and everyone does it, then it just becomes the thing to do and the ticks are on the outside and that's a whole different issue than having them on the inside. So those are my helpful hints. And the uh, DEET that you have is not for anyone under two years of age. You need little mosquito nets um, for the babies and things like that. So I always loved those little mosquito nets. My they looked like little angels in the <laughs> carriages with little mosquitoes. And you could open it up and show your beautiful baby, let people peek at it. So I don't know. But you have to, you know, think about these things. The mosquitoes aren't going away. The Lyme ticks aren't going away. So that's the story on Lyme disease. Any other questions? Just like Michelangelo into the blue On heavenly wings Cargo hand bones don't take off No smoke, no mirror, no strings I can't take off these dark shades I can only say how It's too beautiful Our town, 
Our town on TV, our town, there's you and me. Upside down, hanging out of an airplane. 